What's the point? Oh, no, but you're not. So um, thanks for attending uh, the uh, study skills, or excuse me, this today is the um, today is the listening and note taking session. Um, if you do have background, um, anything going on in the background, you're more than welcome to mute the, um, the microphone if you want, if you have any background uh, coming up, and then you can activate your mic if you have a question. Um, so thank you. So um, again, this is a listening and note taking workshop. Uh, my name is Scott and I'm the supervisor, one of them from uh, tutoring services. Uh, I primarily work with the technical students uh, and technical tutors. Those are the students in the technical programs, uh, many of them of which are at the Micron campus like auto body, machine tool. Uh, then out at the Ada County campus, we have our several of our IT programs, the Canyon County campus, we have our law enforcement physical therapy. And then I've also been doing our study skills workshops for the past uh, 10 years since we've uh, been a school and then uh, prior to that at Boise State. Um, much of the information that I have, um, of course, is provided by students, by faculty that stop in uh, to the workshops. Um, I do appreciate you coming today. And one of the nice things is if you need to get up and take a break, feel free to. Um, I'll stop along the uh, workshop, too, if you need to take a break. Uh, these are the first sessions that we're doing totally on Zoom. I usually like to do these workshops in person, but uh, the pandemic is obviously altered that at least for this semester. Um, I usually give them on the campus. Usually I give some sessions at the Ada County campus and the uh, Napa main campus. Uh, but uh, even when we return back to school on a more normal basis, hopefully in the fall, uh, we'll continue to do these workshops by um, Zoom too, because uh, obviously many students uh, say they're convenient too. Um, I also have a little survey and a uh, uh, a, uh, a critique that you can fill out, feel free to uh, make any comments on that. I'll provide the link to that towards the end of the uh, uh, workshop. If you think of better days and times when you'd like to have uh, these workshops, if they're more convenient, um, please feel free to um, uh, express any other times that you might have. I have some students say that evenings seem to work pretty good after dinner. Um, the other thing that I'll probably do is some of my workshops are 90 minutes long and a couple of students have said maybe decreasing it to 60 minutes. So I am going to take a look at that and and make some adjustments. So um, again, um, I will um, provide a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, even if we don't get through all the slides. Um, you're more than welcome to have the PowerPoint to review over the information and then uh, any other handouts that um, that I uh, provide you can um, I'll I'll put the links into the uh, the chat session there so this one is on note taking and listing note taking is a very interesting workshop because obviously you can't remember everything that you um, you get one of the things I'd like to ask is what kinds of classes you're taking now are any of you uh, taking uh, in person classes where you're going to a physical campus and you can use the uh, chat box again or the little reaction button where you can use the thumbs up. Um, but are any of you uh, either of you taking uh, any in person where you're actually going to a physical campus. Oh, okay, good. Uh, so you are taking some. Huh? Go ahead. Okay, good. And so online. Now for the online classes, um, are those online classes uh, asynchronous where you just read the material and do the assignments without the professor uh, coming on? Or are they a, a high flex remote where um, the class does have a, a lecture component that you attend just like if you're in class? Okay, good. So your mic uh, microbiology is done uh, via by zoom. Okay, good. Yeah, and so that's obviously the big challenge. We The school has always had online classes. Um, they've expanded, of course, the initial online classes before the pandemic are what we call asynchronous, where you just log in, you look at the information provided, you use the discussion board, you uh, read textbooks and notes, um, do assignments and upload them. Um, and then with the result of the pandemic, when it hit last uh, 
about this time last year, I think it was right around March um, that we um, stopped having online or on campus and we kind of went to online. Um, the um, high flex classes came in where teachers would come in over Zoom and then they had, uh, those were the remote classes and then a high flex option. I, I think we have uh, at least 30, 40 classes where you can um, sign up for either the in-class or the um, uh, remote version. So note-taking has obviously um, become a bit of a more interesting challenge in listening because it's more of done in an online environment. And uh, so if you either of you have any strategies or anything that you do um, that help you with taking notes and listening in an online environment, please feel free to share because it is a collaborative workshop. Um, and so there, if there's any comments um, that, that either of you have. The one thing I'll download to you now and I'll put it into the chat is a little note taking inventory. And this inventory just asks a series of questions about your note taking strategies. I also included an inventory that might help you with reading uh, textbooks. Of course, the big challenge with textbooks is online textbooks. How many of you have online textbooks rather than a paper textbook that you have to read? And if so, do you find that challenging or not? So textbooks are a, a big, um, textbooks are a big item. Uh, but so I included a little inventory that uh, you can have and um, uh, yeah, I both in field child. Yeah, I don't particularly care for online textbooks because reading online does take a little bit of a chat. It's a little bit of a challenge as opposed to a, a, a paper book. Um, mainly paper books are nice that you can highlight. I do know some students tell me that in their online textbook, they can highlight certain passages somehow, and I guess it keeps it uh, highlighted. But um, yes, computers, um, computer screens are um, kind of a challenge. Well, one of the things I might send you to is a little ergonomic checklist. Um, I did that for my study skills workshop last week. I'll write this down and see if I can remember. I have a little worksheet that talks about ergonomics that might help with um, eye strain as far as the computer. Um, that's obviously a big one is um, reading on the computer. And sometimes you focus differently on a computer when you're looking at a page as you do to a textbook. Um, so that's one of the items. So this little inventory just has some, and you don't have to actually take the inventory. If you print it out, you can. Um, it does have some circles that you can respond to. Um, the main reason I provide this inventory is so it just, it asks questions about what you might be doing to better prepare yourself for taking notes uh, on a textbook, on multimedia, uh, during a lecture. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, send this um, inventory to you right now through the link on chat. Take me a second to bring it up here. And again, uh, if you save this, you're more than welcome to save it if you pull it up um, uh, or copy it to your computer or print it out uh, if you want. So here's a link to the, um, here's a link to the um, inventory. And like I said, the inventory, it's just a little annotated checklist uh, that, that has certain things like it talks about highlighting, it talks about active reading, there's some things that you do with reading. And like I said, you can actually take the inventory, you can print out certain pages if you want, if you're able to print uh, at home. You can print out certain pages. There is a lecture checklist, note-taking checklist, um, one that has to do with reading. Um, uh, classroom inventory. Now, the classroom inventory uh, might apply too with an online class. Of course, when you speak of a classroom, you're thinking that you're inside a classroom. But if you're taking a class online with Zoom, uh, you can think of it as a classroom. So many of the concepts will be there. And then um, one of the note taking methods I'm not sure if either of you are familiar with or have used is called the Cornell note taking method. It's very popular, a very effective way for taking notes. And so um, 
I included some checklists on that. Although, uh, again, these are just guidelines. If you are using an effect, uh, uh, effective note-taking system now, by all means, I would not recommend changing it. Uh, so uh, feel free to um, use that uh, checklist there. And uh, let me, um, because um, I think one of you might have logged in after I started, let me reload the uh, PowerPoint. And the PowerPoint will come in the form of a PDF. But like I said, I'll go through the PowerPoint and bring it up on the screen here so you can see it. But if either of you want to have a copy of it to, to, doubt, to look at it um, later or when you get a chance to, um, I will uh, be happy to share that. And I'll do that right now. So again, that second link right there is to the PowerPoint presentation. It'll come up in a PDF format that you can have. So just in case uh, you'd like to go back and look at a particular slide that we talk about, um, feel free to. And I have some other um, materials that I'll uh, 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 hand out to. So just out of curiosity, um, do either of you have um, any particular note-taking style or strategies that you use or, um, and does it change from class to class? Uh, do you take notes for things more than a lecture or try to at least, do you take notes for your textbook, notes for any multimedia, uh, notes for even the discussion board perhaps if you have to use the discussion board? Uh, so do either of you have a strategy? Um, yeah, it's a rush. It is definitely a rush to take notes. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do. Notes, you know, kind of give you a recorded history. I do speak to many classes, especially first semester technical program classes about note taking strategies because in a lot of the technical programs, the students want to get out on the floor and start tearing apart the diesel engine or the, the snowmobile or they're getting out into horticulture. The IT students want to start working with servers and things like that. And um, but one of the things they do, especially in the first uh, semester, is take they have to do theory. So we're in the classroom reading textbooks, you know, more like a traditional class, you might think. Um, they have to take notes on a lot of things. And sometimes the teach the instructors tell me they don't take as detailed notes. Um, at all. And it's hard to remember things that you read. Uh, I'm sure you've probably known it's very difficult to read something and remember it without maybe writing it down. So that's one of the challenges. So again, uh, yeah, just let me know. Um, very good. You take notes with partial sentences, and that's an excellent thing. You can't obviously write down everything that the professor says, unless, of course, you record the lecture, which you do. But uh, I have some students that are auditory learners that like to record the lecture. Most professors let you do it. I don't know how the, if they do it online, uh, but I know in the classroom they would let you use a little micro cassette recorder. Um, and um, the only problem with that, of course, is time management. If you have a, an hour lecture and you record it, then you have to sit down and listen to it again using time. But the nice thing is you can stop it and start it, stop it and start it, back it up. And, and so that's pretty effective, but definitely partial sentences. And sentences is one of the, um, I'll send you a handout here that gives you some different options on the kind of note-taking styles. And one of them, of course, is sentences, whether they're incomplete or um, phrases, you know, something that you, you have a record of. So I'm going to go ahead and share the PowerPoint. And again, I sent that to you. You have it in uh, the shared link in a PDF format. And I'll kind of go through a couple of the slides and then stop and get your reflection or if you need to take a break. Um, so I will go ahead and, and uh, share my slide here, share the PowerPoint presentation. Let me get it started here. Are you able to see the PowerPoint okay? Yes. 
Hopefully. Yeah, it came up just fine. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, when I did note taking, uh, I have been doing these workshops for quite a while. When I started doing the note taking strategies, I sometimes, as I mentioned to you before, I have professors that pop in and kind of give me some critiques and some suggestions. And one of them said I might want to include a couple of comments on listening, since listening is a very is a key to taking. Um, obviously, listening you need to have good skills to do for note taking strategies and. Of course, you know, there's listening and hearing and listening is a pretty good discipline. It, it sometimes takes a little work to listen. Um, so I told the professor if she, if, if she could give me some ideas about it. Um, and so I asked my tutors, could you give me a definition of what active listening it is? And it's and of course, you can Google this and find it. Uh, it's uh, taking in stimuli. Um, attaching meaning to words and understanding the message. And obviously that's a big challenge. And, and especially when you're dealing with what kind of information do I need to remember and write down in a lecture? And uh, one of my tutors found this little proverb here, a Cuban proverb, uh, listening looks easy, but it's not simple. Every head is a world. So obviously it's a, it's a big challenge on that. And, um, uh, one of my tutors always likes to include uh, quotes just to kind of get a perspective of the different PowerPoints. She changes the quotes for my my uh, PowerPoints every time. So uh, I always take a look and see if there's any quotes that stick out. I do like that one in the lower right hand corner from uh, Stephen Covey, an educator author. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. Of course, that's big in the our world of politics and election and the pandemic and everybody has a what has the tendency to want to reply to something that's said to them uh, rather than trying to listen and 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 carry it on but that's kind of an interesting um and uh i like uh franz uh lebowitz's uh quote there the opposite of talking isn't listening the opposite of talking is waiting and that's something that we teach the tutors. Obviously, when uh, a tutor asks a question to a student, you immediately don't want to start talking. You have to allow a chance to, to for the, the person you're talking to to think about how they want to reply. And so these are, you know, just some interesting quotes. Uh, Jeanette Winston up there, everything in writing begins with language, language begins with listening. And so, yeah, these are some pretty good quotes. They always come up with some good ones. And um, I, tie, I tried to tie this PowerPoint presentation to uh, listening and, and note-taking in a four-step process. The process of listening, uh, the process of listening and note-taking strategies, um, and then the actual note-taking system. Um, what kinds of note-taking strategies might you use? Do you use Cornell? Do you use sentence? Do you use mapping? Do you use outline? Do you just use anything you can to keep up with the professor's lecture or the material? And then what do you do with your notes afterwards? Uh, for example, when I work with students that struggle with content, I always ask the student, um, when you take notes in class, when, uh, when do you go back and look at your notes? And so I might ask, uh, I might ask. I like, I like to go look immediately after class when I have time and then fill in any gaps. Oh my gosh. That I you. may have. Exactly. Thank you very much for that comment, because that's one thing that happens. You want to look at your notes as quick as you can after class. And so just to give you a quick example, when I worked at the Ada County campus for a while, I would see a student out in the student common area, which is perfectly fine, taking a break between classes. And then when they come and see me for help with study skills or help with a, a concept, I'll notice that they're out, they, I'll ask them when they took their class, and then I notice that they're maybe out in the student common area. And when I see them, they're on social media, which we all are, of course, Facebook, email, our phone, uh, Twitter. Um, but I ask them, did you ever have a minute, like even 10 to 15 minutes to look at your notes and fill in the gaps? And, uh, and surprising the number of students that'll get done with a class and then maybe they don't take about five to 10 minutes and just kind of review their notes real quickly. 
because obviously the longer you wait after you take their notes, the less you're going to remember from the lecture. So thank you very much for that that uh, comment. And yeah, that's why I do it. It just instills what I learned again by just reviewing it real quick and then filling in gaps where I didn't take good enough notes. Beautiful. While yeah. it's fresh. Yes, while it's fresh, definitely. <laughs> and it, you can't do that. And of course, I, I know in a, in, a, in a classroom environment, obviously, if you have like, say, a Monday, Wednesday class, you're probably going to look at your notes a little more frequently between the Monday and the Wednesday class. But then after the Wednesday class is done, you go, oh, I don't have this class again until the following Monday. So then you have Wednesday evening, then you have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and even part of Monday, depending on when the class meets. So that's like five days that could go before you might tend to look at your notes again. So that's kind of how I put this together. And again, I don't expect you to read everything on this here, but it's just... Uh, one of the teachers just suggested I might include a little listening component in here. Obviously, you have the different kinds of verbal communication. We talk about um, undivided attention. And of course, undivided attention is when you give the speaker the most undivided attention. But we really react more in what's called fluctuating attention. You're listening. You might tune out briefly while you're taking notes or doing something. And then you have to refocus again. And it's a repetitive process. So. That's that's it. And then, of course, there's different kinds of listening. And some uh, and if you've taken a comm class, I know you probably or a, a quid class, you probably have studied listening strategies. Um, there's like four or five different kinds of listening strategies. But for the purposes of this uh, study skills workshop, I focus with active listening, trying to give undivided attention and, and trying to understand and learn new information. And then critical listening, which is trying to examine and interpret what the speaker's messages or the in this case the professor or what what the professor is trying to convey in an online class if they provide you with material to review and then obviously there's factors that affect listening and note taking which include your attitude towards the course reaction towards the instructor you know and then we in my study skills workshop i talk about the different um, learning styles of the instructors some just like to talk and and they just talk the whole time and then um you're trying to write notes other instructors might use models they might use examples they might give you powerpoints the topic is a big thing familiarity you'll see this repeated a little bit do you familiar side do you familiarize yourself with the terminology and the concepts especially if you're going to be studying a new um, concept. Say next week, you might be studying a new concept in a chemistry class or a, a philosophy class. Do you take the time? Do you go through the textbook and look at the, the textbook? Sometimes they have like a little thing at the front of the textbook that says, this is what you'll cover. And then obviously, what's a big thing in a textbook? Terms, terminology, if you're in a class that uses a lot of terminology. And of course, in this case of the CTE programs like Auto Body, there's a ton of term terminology that they'll discuss in, in various uh, concepts. And so um, it's always good to get a, build up your terminology a little bit. What kind of distractions? And this is a whole new thing if you want to share. Obviously, you're in an online environment. So now you've got, if you're at home studying, what kinds of interruptions do you have at home? The biggest one, obviously, that students tell me are kids and pets but it could be other things too. Um, I live in a fairly new subdivision, so there's been construction going on and sometimes it get, can get pretty loud. Um, and then your physical factors, like your um, emotional state, a physical state, it's sometime a little bit, I, I could use a little more exercise myself. So getting out during the day instead of than sitting in a chair for seven hours, eight hours. And then one of you mentioned, um, I strain on the computer, look, reading ergonomics, and I need to uh, see if I'm, when I'm done here, I'll see if I can provide that erg ergonomics uh, handout for you. So does anybody have any comment or reflection on those? Yes, family is a big one. Children and, and pets um, obviously are the huge challenge in an online environment.
So see, uh, again, you have this on the slide. So obviously the attitude, a positive attitude, um, what do you intend to learn? What's, why is it beneficial? Well, if you have to take a test on it, that's obviously beneficial. Um, how you present yourself. Now this, this, of course, obviously is a big thing in a classroom environment, uh, probably so too on a, on a class that's in Zoom because the professor can, uh, if you've got your camera turned on, the professor can obviously see but I know many professors will look and see how their eye contact is. It lets them know um, uh, what kind of engagement they're going to have with the class if they see that. So you can't rely on audio memory alone unless you're Dr. Spencer Reed on Criminal Minds who has an eadictic memory. <laughs> kind of remembers everything that he sees and hears. Uh, this is a big one. And so this is where I get involved in um, note, uh, note taking strategies with the technical students. Many of them just could use a little bit of uh, re-engagement on taking notes in a lecture. The other thing that they like, for example, the auto body, excuse me, the automotive students have to deal with is not only do they have to deal with the physical lecture for the professor, they actually have to go onto a computer for several hours a week and look at um, like they go on like a Toyota or a Ford website and they have to study pictures of transmissions. And basically it's very much like an online class, but they're given a ton of material over the computer and then they're tested. And so uh, sometimes taking notes on that is helpful. And then how many of us have our mind wandering? And this is something that's kind of a new challenge in an online environment. You're looking at the screen, but you're not looking. You know, you're looking at it, but are you focused on it? And this is a big thing, especially in an online environment now. And questions, do any of your professors give you, especially in an online environment, if the class is uh, synchronous, like you mentioned Zoom, does the professor at say the end of a lecture, does he or she give you an opportunity to ask questions? Good, she does great. Yeah, that's one thing I always try to do when I taught classes at Boise State, I always would disengage 10 minutes before the end of my lecture. Um, yeah, and I would ask the students, and this is a golden opportunity. This is one of the most missed opportunities if you are ever offered um, a chance to ask questions, you know, what kind do you ask open ended questions where there's a, a lot of answers, a closed ended question obviously is for a specific answer or result. Probing questions are a big one like who, what, where, when, why does it, why does this reaction take place when this occurs. And then leading questions is where um, you kind of reflect the question back to the professor. So what you're saying, uh, Professor Johnson, is if I do this or we do this, then this result will happen. So you kind of re-paraphrase the question back. And so uh, if any of you use those kinds of questions, that's a golden opportunity. But um, uh, I had a professor at Boise State in a philosophy class, and he used to belittle us if we asked a question almost every time, I, Mr. Barron, why are you asking that question? I just got done talking about it. And he actually scared a lot of the students until we all got together and decided, you know what, he belittles everybody, but everybody appreciated that question being asked because a lot of people, but some people got scared. So we all just kind of got together and figured, you know what, he's do uh, for whatever reason, we don't know why he's belittling us. So we just all would ask questions and then kind of close our eyes when he when he starts to belittle you for like about a minute. But the funny thing is he would answer your question after that. He just had this knack for kind of challenge why you would ask a, such a question to him. And so in the first couple of weeks, students were afraid to ask questions, but we just kind of all got over it because everybody else in the class was super appreciative that you asked that question. I don't know if any of you've had a similar experience like that, but uh, he was pretty straightforward in his way like that. These are obviously um, big things to, um, to look at 
in the lecture and note taking uh, the headings of information. Um, and this is something during a lecture, um, when you hear professors, when I say headings, whether or not it's important to take notes in something like this, you can tell by certain lead in questions. For example, the professor might say, well, the advantages of this, uh, advantages of this option or the benefits or causes or reasons. Um, when you hear key words like that, that's super important to kind of focus on. Or if you hear, hear her say, oh, well, the disadvantages of this. So watching, listening for key words on main ideas, the same thing. Sometimes uh, students will tell me they struggle with main ideas. Do any of you, are you able to tell when a professor is um, providing a main idea in their lecture? Do they uh, give you hints of any kind? Uh, sometimes it'll be, uh, they'll say, well, first this will happen. It's a simple case of using words like first, second, and third, or they'll say, well, the next thing that will happen, another thing will happen, and or they might say, and finally this will happen. Oh, thank you very much. Definitely. Um, professor says, write this down. Oh, that couldn't be a better way. And some professors in the technical program will, if they see students or not, our seat are dozing off, they'll say, this might be an important question for the test. <clears throat> so thank you. Write it down. I, 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 I love a professor that does that. Yeah, there's usually a shift and a new opening. Yeah, definitely. Uh, terminology is a big thing, obviously. And this is one thing that frustrates some professors when I speak to their classes is the students know when a chapter is going to be discussed because they provide it in their syllabus, but they don't look at the terminology. So, um, and the terminology obviously in a textbook is usually found in the back. Sometimes they'll have like key terms or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's a very important thing um, is, is terminology. So if you have a, a grasp of at least the terms is a big one. <laughs> uh, supporting details. Uh, sometimes when a professor provides, when she provides the uh, heading, how do you know what the supporting details are? Um, or in a textbook when you're reading, if you're taking notes and supporting details, look for what we call ordinals, like numbers, like they might say, well, first, the first, this is the first step towards this, and this is the second, or they might say, um, lastly, or another step. And so you want to look for those kinds of things in either a textbook, if you're taking notes, or the professor might, if they're describing a concept that has steps in it. So you can kind of pick that out. Um, how about verbal cues? Do your professors provide you any verbal cues that might help be helpful when taking notes? Um, there are many verbal cues by now. I, what we end about the fourth week, fifth week, if you have a, a, now this is harder to do in an online class because obviously if it's an online asynchronous class, you don't have an opportunity to listen to the professor. Um, but you see a change in the vo in the professor's um, mannerisms. They're, if they're moving around or their face changes, their uh, vo voice. Sometimes when a professor emphasizes something, they'll raise their voice. Okay, good. Their pitch changes, inflection as we call it. Their speaking patterns change. Um, or they might have a habit of um, if they're looking down, they might look up or something. And so you kind of look for little verbal cues that could tell you that when a, when a bit of information is important to write down. Okay, they recorded. Okay, that's cool. They changed the colors of the slides. Very good, a visual, we have a visual professor right there that, that changes colors in the slides. That's pretty nice. And then uh, lectures that are recorded. So when the lectures are recorded, you can play them back. Perfect, big, big advantage, big advantage. Yeah, so that's the challenges that obviously a challenge is in a typical lecture class where you only hear it once and you don't get to hear it again uh, from that case. 
And then the conclusion. Um, obviously, if a professor is talking about a particular concept, they might go and in closing or to summarize. Those are little keywords. Yes, pausing is great to take notes. I love that is when you can stop a recording. And that's one of the, that's one of the advantages. If I have students in a typical classroom, um, they will um, uh, uh, record the lecture, but then you have to go back and listen to it again. But that's like a recording. You can stop it. I did that in a geology class at BSU. The problem is that the geology class, because it met once a week, it had a two and a half hour lecture and three hour lab. So basically it was a five hour week of class on the one day a week. Obviously you take breaks, but listening to a professor lecture for two and a half hours is pretty intense. And then you have like a 30 minute break and then you go right into the lab for another three hours. And so that was, I'll never take a class like that again, but uh, I did experience that. It is, it, it, the, the big thing on a class like that is you just don't wanna be sick and miss one Saturday. Cause that is, I mean, that you're talking two and a half hours of lecture at a three hour lab that you'd have to make up. So, yeah. But you know, students tell me that when they took that class, they remembered it more because it was longer and more focused. And even when you had breaks, it, they, they enjoyed the lecture for two and a half hours, one day a week, then going to the lecture like three days a week for 50 minutes or something like that. So they found that to be um, very good. Here's one of the big things I included this. I a professor actually said you might want to um, include this. What a, what a kind of problems do we have in writing? Well, typically we think at about 400 words a minute, we speak at around 125 words a minute and we can only write at about 30 words a minute. So this presents a big problem because obviously if, a, and the thing is if a speaker if you have an instructor that actually speaks slowly, your rate of thinking will outpace the instructor's rate of speech um, and, and your mind can wander off. So sometimes some students tell me that it's just as bad for a professor to speak very slowly than it is to a professor to speak very quickly. Obviously, the faster they talk, the harder it is to keep up and write notes. But the same thing kind of the opposing thing can happen if they're too slow, your mind kind of races ahead. Like, oh, what are they gonna talk about next? What is she gonna present next? What is he gonna say next? And so your mind is trying to anticipate and then you kind of lose focus on writing notes at that time. Now here, if, you, if either of you have some comments on what do you do with rate discrepancies, do you keep trying to keep writing? Trying to keep writing, it's not easy, but that's one item to do. You kind of mentally summarize uh, what the professor is saying. You kind of predict where the professor is going to go with the next concept or uh, item that they're talking about. You paraphrase and reflect the, the speaker. This is where you kind of are putting it in your own words then rather than writing it down verbatim what the professor is saying, depending on the lecture, this is a little bit harder to do because you're, if you're understanding or trying to learn a new concept. Do either of you use abbreviations and symbols or kind of abbreviate words or things? Yes, it's a really good idea, but um, as one of you mentioned about looking at your lecture notes right afterward, if you use an abbreviation that you, that you use, one of the frustrating things is, I used to abbreviate certain things. And then if I didn't look at my notes quick enough after the lecture, I'd forget what the abbreviation meant. And then um, I, I think Stephanie, you might've mentioned that using um, modified printing where maybe you move to a sentence format where you just take down sentences or paraphrase it. Do you have a YouTube channel and then uh, watch the speakers fast? I have to slow down the video. Yes. Yes, and then definitely, perfect, I'm filling in the gaps, great, thank you for that, definitely. Uh, that's why, and one of the things you wanna do in note-taking, I tell students, if you do lose track of the lecture, leave a gap in your notes 
to show that, yes, there was a, a gap because you couldn't keep up. And I actually go one step further with, for those students that maybe talk to other students, I actually write the time down when the gap occurred. Like if I have a class from 12 to one, say around uh, 1230, I had a little bit of a gap. That way, if I get with another student, I can say, well, it was about halfway through the lecture when I started to have a problem. There you go, really good. But I do that. I tell some students, write down the time. And then I always, because I always try to find a student that, uh, even in an online class, I'll try to find a student that that uh, I can interact with. And I'll say, oh, yeah, right around halfway through the course lecture, I had a gap. And, and could maybe you help me to understand what the professor was talking about at that particular time. And there it is, leaving gaps in notes is a good one. And then sometimes you can shift to a paragraph form. You just write it out in a paragraph or as quick as you can, but um, um, you just write it out in a paragraph. And then you, as, you, as, a, as, you, as you mentioned, you go back afterwards and you can make adjustments and fill in the gaps. And that obviously that one option you can do. This is when I have students that are in like an in class where they simply just cannot keep up with the professor. So I say, well, you can buy a, a usually these recorders or even your cell phone can record um, if the professor is willing. And most professors I think are willing to, they just tell you if you put their your recorder up by their podium, you can't go up and start fiddling with it once the lecture starts. So um, that's one thing. I years ago when I took class, I used they had these little micro cassette recorders and they would, um, work for maybe like 60 minutes at a time. So usually in a long lecture, the professor would stop. And then of course, those of us that had these micro set recorders, we'd run up to the classroom real click and flip the tape around and then start it again. Uh, but you couldn't do that during the lecture, obviously, because that's one of the uh, rules that you can't go up and fiddle with your micro cassette recorder if you have it up by the professors where the professor is speaking. So this is just a little hierarchical sheet that kind of shows you uh, the kinds of things that can help you with streaking in your note taking. Obviously, you've got that rate discrepancy that we talked about. Um, familiarizing yourself with the topic. If we were in a psychology class and um, say I was the professor and I said, okay, next week class, we're going to talk about Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So, and if you have no clue what that uh, is, what might you do between now and the lecture to help you with that? Yep, read about it, Google it. I mean, you don't wanna use Wikipedia as your official source, but one of the things I might do is just Google it. Just, there you go, thank you, research, very good. Yeah, you'd kind of wanna familiar yourself. Um, and the other thing is, say in a psych class, you were talking about Munchausen syndrome or Munchausen syndrome, I think it pronounced. Say you were talking about that and then the professor says, okay, on Tuesday, we're gonna talk about Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Well, you already know what Munchausen syndrome is. So what the heck does it mean when they say by proxy? So that's looking at um, how you would build up and preview the terms. Um, I try to tell students that are visual learners to try to make a movie in their mind. Do any of you have professors that sidetrack? When they're doing a lecture? Yeah. Um, is it kind of frustrating if you're taking lecture notes and they sidetrack? Definitely. Now, just to give you a little bit of a, uh, from a historical perspective, I took a marketing class at BSU many years ago, and it was a basic marketing class, understanding the fundamentals of the marketing principle from when a product is first introduced to when the product basically dies. It's, it's not viable to sell anymore for any of a host of reasons. And the professor used to sidetrack all the time. He would start his lecture and we're all writing notes, and then he'd get off on a tangent and um, one of the things we talked about was start like starting a restaurant. And obviously one of the big things in starting a restaurant is location, location, location. And so he would talk about in Boise here, uh, people that start restaurants, 
And then you get off on a sidetrack and be talking about this restaurant, like over in Vista, if you're familiar with the train station in Boise on Vista, um, there's a, a little strip mall across the street from it. Uh, I think it's in the Vista shopping area there. And he would get off and start talking about a restaurant specifically or something in there. And lo and behold, when the test comes around, his first question is, what was the name of the restaurant I was talking about that the person had such a hard time marketing? And I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't write that down. <laughs> and he was trying to make a point because in this particular case, you can't make a left turn if you're going south on Vista where this restaurant's located. And so people that are, and he had his restaurant and he liked to serve dinner meals. And so the, the, um, the crux of the story is if people are coming home from working in the downtown core of Boise by the Capitol and they go home down Vista, if they say they wanna to stop to get a drink or have a nice lunch or a meeting, you can't make a left turn from Vista. You, you have to go down farther and either turn around or drive through the mall, or you have to make a left turn before that and go behind a neighborhood or something like that. And so this person's restaurant failed because of the location. It just didn't apply. It was too difficult for the customers to get to based on that uh, time of the day. Um, so yeah. So anyway, that's a good thing on sidetracking. And then of course, looking at the visual cues we talked about, and then the nonverbal cues. Then that would involve lectures that you have either online where you see the professor's um, body gestures, inflection, voice changes, and things like that. And if like one of you mentioned, this is important to write down. <laughs> so there you go. I kind of included this slide because obviously one of the big things, and this is uh, getting back to those technical programs that I mentioned, um, it, you can't remember everything that you read by itself. If you do not reinforce it by jotting down notes or, or doing some other way to help you with your reading, after about a week, you could lose up to 80 to 90% of the material. But you'll see what happens if you start hearing it. Students read out loud a little bit if they can, important points. Obviously, the, uh, the, for example, the recording of the lecture, you're watching it. Um, you can stop it. And so you can see the more you get involved with it. That's why notes are so important um, because you have a chance, the notes are yours. And so you have a chance to hold the paper, to read through them. If you type your notes on the screen, you can go back through. So the more you get involved physically with your notes, um, the greater chance you have to remember the concepts. And this here is um, why it's important to review your notes as many times as possible, like 15 minutes, an hour. If you can't, because maybe you're busy, at least at the end of the, the school day or work day. Uh, professor Abenhaus was a German professor that studied memory. And he developed, he actually developed this memory curve. And so you can see that if you, the longer that you review, the more frequently you review, even if it's short reviews, the greater you have for um, remembering. That's good about underlining keywords and highlighting points. Excellent, thank you for that comment. I will reread and highlight. There you go, so the repetition, perfect, perfect. So I'll take a stop for just a second if you need to get something to drink or whatever. Just, um, and if you have a question or just um, want to stand up for a minute. Um, and we'll get into some actual note taking systems. And this is where you can kind of share um, any particular strategies that you might have with taking notes. Great. So do any of you use a particular note taking system um, or a combination of, I know, I think Sevi, did you mention you use like a sentence format?
I've been trying different strategies to see what works the best for me. Uh-huh. And for different subjects, different things work. Good. Sometimes I have to do main points and sub points. Sometimes it's partial sentences. And then it depends on if I'm taking notes out of a textbook or from a lecture or yes. video. Sometimes the videos, I can't replay it or pause it. And I have to take a quiz from the video. Oh, okay. And that's really annoying <laughs> because you kind of only get one shot. <laughs> oh, yes. Do you have to and take they'll ask the most weird questions out of the video? I'm like, but that isn't even the subject that we're learning. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Do you have to take the quiz right after you look at the video? Yes, Ooh. immediately. Okay. After. Wow. That, that can be a challenge. So there's a challenge. <laughs> That is definitely a challenge. But what I find myself doing is because every teacher is different, every situation is different, I'm learning that I have to use note taking and highlighting based on the, the way the teacher gives the quizzes, <laughs> not necessarily on what stuff I should be absorbing long term. So I can find the answers more quickly if I can't recall them uh -huh. easily. Okay. So that's yes. been different. Yeah, definitely. And it's not uncommon that I've had students tell me that they don't, they have to modify their note taking strategies for each class because of how that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And that's a big thing like outlining and sometimes, uh, well, for an example, um, when I took an econ class, the professor would give us PowerPoints. Um, and so in a lot of cases, I used an outline type format just because of how the professor provided it. But then I would use the Cornell method in my uh, philosophy class because you're trying to learn concepts where there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer. You just have to be able to argue your point. <laughs> um, so I found the Cornell method to be uh, that. And then for visual students, um, mapping is an interesting concept. Um, I will show you an example of mapping and charting and um, oh, in the Cornell method. Do either of you use the Cornell method or tried it before? It's an interesting note taking method. Sometimes it's not the most effective to. Um, OK, and we'll talk about what the Cornell method is. It's kind of an interesting um, method. It's a little hard to take it in class. Um, unless you know ahead of time what the professor is going to talk about, you know, especially the different concepts. So we'll, I'll share that uh, for you. It was invented by Dr. Rob, uh, Walter Pock at Cornell University, hence that's why it's called the Cornell Method. Um, it involves, um, on the right hand side of the page, and I'll show you some examples. Matter of fact, I have some pages. I'm going to stop the PowerPoint for a minute and upload some documents for you. You record on the right hand column the information supporting details, paraphrases, and then what goes on the left side are the key and main points. You can actually buy this paper at the store. Um, if you want, you can make it yourself using a ruler and making a vertical line, or you can go to places like Office Depot, Amazon. One of the companies is called Focus Notes, and I'll write that down. It's this right here in the chat. If you Google Focus Notes or go to um, Good, in your cycle. It's called Focus Notes, and it's um, actually a name brand. Um, it's a blue binder, usually with a spiral on the top of it. Um, Focus Notes, and I'm going to show you. I, I uh, really push this if you can use it, um, even for when you make what we call summary notes. And I'll kind of cover that in a few minutes, what, a, what summary notes are. And this is what helps you. You can explain it out loud using the Cornell method, and then you can reflect. Reflection means you kind of put it in your own words, uh, what the concept is that the professor is explaining or what you're trying to learn from the text or the notes. And then you can continue to use this method as you review. Like you mentioned, you like to review your notes 
after class and, and it's helpful to review it often um, on there. And these are the different advantages. And then what I'm gonna do is stop the PowerPoint for a minute so you can kind of see, I'll upload the example so you can see um, what these differences are and the different the methods. The Cornell method is very systematic. It's an easy format to pull out the major and the minor concepts. It does save time and effort. When, if you can use this method, there isn't any real disadvantages to the Cornell method. And you can use it for online classes, in-class lectures, and the book method. The outline method, you can just think of an outline like Roman numeral one, A, number one and two, B, one and two. Um, it's, it's just as, um, um, it's very organized method. Um, it's easy to review the main point because obviously the main point would be like Roman numeral run and then the sub points would be underneath. It does require a little more effort if you try to use an a outline type format in a lecture. And sometimes it may not show the relationship like cause and effect or the sequences uh, that you might have to use like a mapping method or um, a sentence method. And of course, the outline method is a little hard to use if you have a fast paced lecture. But this is an excellent method for um, taking notes in a textbook, be mainly because if you notice how many textbooks are set up, the real, real thick bold print could be the main point, then you might see a little smaller print and sometimes they change the color, like you might have black main topic and then the subtopics might be in like blue or red and then underneath you might see smaller prints so it's an excellent um it's an excellent method for book taking um if you're taking notes from a textbook i don't know if any of you've seen a charting method but i'll show you what a charting method looks like this is especially useful for events or material that's in chronological order um, sets up columns. I'll show you an example of a charting method. The charting method and the um, mapping method are very similar, but the mapping method, you draw little lines uh, between them. Oh, like to connect uh, relationships? There like you, you go, would... exactly. To connect relationships, you can use them. Again, it's a very effective method if you're a visual learner and you can connect the methods. Um, but you may not hear the changes in from the major to the um, points to the facts. So that's one of the, the challenges. And then of course, there's the sentence method where you just write short sentences or paraphrase. And this is an excellent one if you're in a hurry, if you need to write down the points in a hurry because you're just trying to get through the lecture. But if again, if you try to edit this kind of format, you may have to end up rewriting your notes. And some now some students treat, rewrite your notes. I don't necessarily recommend rewriting your notes, but some students will find it necessary to rewrite your notes. So with that, let me stop for a minute and bring up um, what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to go to the chat. There is one, and then I'm going to down. It looks pretty much the same. Uh, the only difference is um, this gives you some of the uh, different types of note taking styles. And I'll just show you, um, whoop. Uh, 
here's a different, and this again, I, I provided you on the link, but here, this is like an example of a charting method of taking notes where you may put the main point over here, sub point, and you can invent as many columns as you need for the chart. Here is the Cornell method where you have the key points over on the left sheet, the sub points are on the right sheet, and then the summary is at the bottom. The summary is written in your own words. Then you, and I apologize for the outlining method. This should have come out a little clearer, but you see where you have like a one with sub points, a, a, a Roman numeral two. And there is an example of the, um, there's an example of the mapping method where you maybe put a, a concept there and sub points, and then you can show the relationship and break them down. So um, those are, um, that's um, some of the examples there of the, um, and you can open up the other one too, if you want. Um, and you can kind of see uh, again, the different styles and I'll, I'll bring up, I'm going to download the Cornell methods and blank sheets for you too. So you can kind of see the Cornell method uh, too. And then I'll show, I'll go back onto the PowerPoint and show you just what some of them look like when you do that. So let me download a couple of the blank sheets of the um, Cornell method for you that you can print out and have. And like I said, if you, you can use this um, procedure or you can go to the store and buy them, it's called Focus Notes. It comes in a little um, a pad, but let me download the sheets and I'll give you two examples of what they look like. So this last link right here should be a link. Um, oh yeah, definitely, thank you. Yeah, microbiology and the sciences really are affected. Matter of fact, thank you for bringing that up because I'll show you an example of what it looks like in a science class using the, um, the Cornell method. Um, but it's definitely a very effective method for um, that. Matter of fact, let me see if I can bring it up now and I'll show you. Let me see if I can get an example here. Okay, I'll share my screen here again and you can see it. This is an example um, of summary notes where again, you have the Q, what we call the Q points or the main points are on the left. Then you have the sub points on the right. And then down below you use reflection. It's like, and you can, you, this reflection can be just what this page is, or say you took several pages of notes for a lecture, you can use the last page to reflect the notes. The reflection is just an overall view of the notes um, that you have taken um, in class. Uh, let's see, I'll bring up another example here.
this is an example of summary notes in a writing class. Um, you'll see up here, it's basically what the lecture is for a particular day and kind of an overview. And then the key point, and this person used kind of a modified outline version along with the summary notes. And they actually numbered it like, what is the significance of the speaker and the poem? And then they kind of write the uh, sub points. And you'll notice, what do you see that you notice here? Um, what can you see on this? You can see um, uh, coloring. They, this person uses red to emphasize certain things, circle certain key points, and then highlight certain points right there when you do that. So you can kind of kind of get an overview. So this person uses both color and outline and uh, visually uh, when they're taking that. This is kind of an overview here of how um, the Cornell method is pretty good. You kind of record the sub points over in the thicker part of the area of the page, and then you can use it. You mentioned you, you discuss it after class. Um, you mentioned that you discuss it after class, uh, which is very effective. Yeah, you got to be careful. It takes a little bit of practice to use the uh, focus notes about recording uh, the, the sub points over here and then the key points on the left. And this is a little bit a challenging of a, a format. Again, in the if you're going to try this for a lecture, what I have some students do is they'll do their lecture in their like a note format or they'll do the lecture in a um, paragraph format or a sentence format. Then I tell them, Take a look at, get the Cornell method and put, put the Cornell paper next to your notes or your textbook or whatever you do and see if you can write what's called summary notes. Summary notes represent key points that you really think are important out of your notes, especially if they're gonna be brought up on a test or you just wanna kind of review them. Um, so you use what's called summary notes where you put the key points from your main notes into these summary notes. You kind of wanna condense it. And that's kind of a good idea. Again, it takes a little more work, but I tell some students, if it feel it's a little bit of a struggle to do the summary, the Cornell notes during a lecture, do the note taking as best as you can in the procedure that you like. And you brought up the fact too, that you have to use different note taking system depending on a class, then try to consolidate it using the uh, Cornell method. Now, what's the nice method reason about this? You see where this at the, about a fourth way over on the page, you can fold over, you can fold over the sheet of paper so you can hide this area where it says record and recall you fold it over and then you just see the left hand side and you try to test yourself. And um, that's great. Yes. While reading a textbook and practice. Yeah, textbook reading is super effective because you have the chance to kind of work out your own note taking strategy when you are um, when you are um, taking notes. You'll see the column system. This I just thought I'd show you real quickly so you have an idea of the column system. This works good for terminology and topics. Remember I mentioned earlier, what if you wanted to know about Munchausen syndrome by proxy? You can, um, yeah, self-quizzing is really good with the Cornell method. And um, so over here, you might put the term that you're studying in the center column of this example, you can see where they, uh, it, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is where a caregiver or a spouse fabricates or exaggerates or induces uh, mental physical problems. Um, and then over here on the third column, you can see where it says concept, uh, consider problematic, multiple medical problems, unexplained medical illnesses. This is what they look at, sir, for example, for Munchausen syndrome. And by proxy means that you could have a caregiver like a parent that's purposely making a child sick just for the attention 
Um, that's what the difference is. Munchausen's when you do it to yourself, but by proxy means you do it, the, the, the caregiver does it to another person. You can see you can use it for map like FOIL. What does FOIL mean? Well, first, outer, inner, last, and then you kind of can explain it or you can actually put a problem in there as an example. So some students studying map concepts go that route. Say you're taking a geography or a geology class. Well, what is the continental shelf? Well, it's a shallow sloping area uh, around the margin of the continents. And then over on the far right side, you can put more detailed information. Depth 400 feet, 90% of the fish and shellfish are harvested from the continental shelf as it extends out 45 miles. How many of you use flashcards? They are still an extremely popular method for uh, testing uh, and, and just understanding material. Flashcards are super great. I try to use flashcards for the technical students. Um, I tell the technical students to use flashcards as best they can when talking about particular concepts. Yes, thank you, especially for terminology. Can't find a better way of learning terms than testing yourself with flashcard. The nice thing is you can have somebody that's not taken the class test you. So even though I've not taken maybe geology, um, although that was the class I told you about that was the five hours, I would write, I could have a student, oh, what are you studying? Well, I'm studying uh, philosophy or I'm studying um, organic chemistry. Well, do you have some terms? Well, even though I've not taken organic chemistry in a long time, I certainly could, if they have flashcards, I could test the person. So it's an excellent system for somebody to help um, in that respect. What are some of the challenges for taking uh, notes in an online class? What to record, basically. And it's basically the same as what you would do in an in-class, but obviously, what other things might you have to consider taking notes on? Discussion board posts, course materials and readings. Can any of you think of anything else that you've noticed in your online classes that you might have to take notes on? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it could be infinite number of things. Um, I bring up collaborative note taking. This is not used too much, but some students kind of, I, I've, I've noticed some students kind of work together, uh, maybe in a class, you know, as much as they can. Obviously, there's certain assignments you can't work on. Um, so sometimes I see students out in the student common area kind of collaborating with their notes. Um, it's, that's a great idea if, you, if you're allowed to do that is to share what you know for your note. Remember you mentioned about gaps in notes and how you fill them in. This is when students get together if they can after a class, maybe they can fill in the missing gaps together. And it's really um, the thing you wanna be careful for is obviously if you're working with another student that's note-taking strategies might not be as strong, um, you, you'd wanna kind of you know, work together and make sure. So that's one thing to look at. Uh, some of you mentioned some strategies for, um, I believe some of you mentioned some strategies for um, creating annotations like I tell some students, you, you don't want to over highlight. I've seen some textbooks that students get and the whole page is highlighted. Is that very effective if you highlight the whole page? It's not because you're over highlighting. You might highlight the um, topic sentence of a paragraph or a concept and then um, key phrases. And then I heard a couple of you mention about circling terms. Another thing that's helpful is to create margin notes. So if you have a very important concept, you can leave the margin open where you might put into the margin a key point. Like maybe you were taking notes from the textbook and the professor provided a very important key concept to the notes that you were taking from the textbook. Um, you might add that over into the margin next to the notes that you're doing. Thank you, I paraphrase in the margin, very good. That's really good. Enumerating steps simply means that if you have notes where you notice that there's a step or a process you have to do, make sure you highlight, well, this is the first step, second step, you know, kind of write it in. So 
That's what it means when you say enumerating. And then you have over here, you know, um, rereading your annotations out loud if you can, um, trying to string together the ideas in your notes. Oh, and then you want to kind of recite without looking. So that's where you can cover your notes up and try to recite. That's where the Cornell method comes in. And then I mentioned the use of summary notes where you kind of make notes very brief notes of the super important concept from your main notes or the textbook. And sometimes those summary notes are what you review the day before a test, because you don't want to try to read all of your notes or try to read a chapter before. So whatever you kind of review the day before a test is what's going to be most uh, prevalent in your memory. It's called the recency effect when you do your memory. You kind of remember what's you've reviewed the most recent. And so if you just study over key concepts. Um, that's a really big help. And then what kind of practice do you space your review out? You know, you mentioned reviewing your notes five minutes after class, if you can, or 10 minutes. Um, and then maybe reviewing them at uh, certain times of the week. Because the more you use your notes, obviously, the better they, you know, you're going to help remember content uh, when you do that. Here's an example here uh, real quickly. I'll give you this an example. When I used to fill in for a history professor and I had study groups, um, this is an example of a mapping method. It doesn't use uh, the lines per se. Uh, suppose I said, uh, you have to write a report. Suppose it was Friday and I said real quickly, okay, I, I'd like you to um, write a page paper or a two page paper about a particular decade in US history, and you can pick the decade you want. So how would you approach that? How might, uh, what kind of options might you do to um, approach something like that? One option you can look at is, um, breaking the dec date, decade down using this mapping method. Like you might talk about entertainment, sports, the political government, the social and cultural changes of that decade, what kind of things happened in education, uh, what kind of scientific things occurred. Um, obviously, when you're talking about this decade, the pandemic is obviously going to come up. So what achievements or things? Fashion is a good thing. And like I said, this is just an example. And then off of each one of these, you would kind of break like uh, political. Well, what kind of things happened politically during the decade? And you know, you can you can break off this diagram in as any uh, any format that you want. And so that's um, that's kind of a really good. Uh, good example of, of using a math mapping method. And you can make it circular or you can draw little lines to it. Um, that's how some students sometimes will come to me with a topic. They say, I have to write a topic and I don't know how to begin. Well, let's do a map. Let's kind of map it out and brainstorm. Um, so that's kind of a kind of an example there. So I think that pretty much um, covers most of what I had. I was going to bring up and see if there was any other uh, handouts I can provide for you. Oh, remember I mentioned the, um, the summary notes there. Let's see here if I find. Here's an example of, uh, let me share the screen again here with you real quickly because I just have a few minutes here. Um, this is an example of a chemistry class uh, using um, the Cornell note method. What is the difference between resonant structures and true structures? And then you'll see the person drew some diagrams. They use color to kind of emphasize certain concepts. And then they kind of wrote a um, little synopsis or a little reflection down below. So that is an example of... Um, a summary notes. However, they don't necessarily have to be. Um, they don't necessarily have to be in the Cornell method. Um, 
apps help. Yes, yeah, studying, note taking on our Microsoft use. Okay, they use Cerego. Is that how it's pronounced? Cerego for terms? Yes. Good. Another way that you can do summary notes, just so you know that it's not totally in the um, not totally in the um, Cornell method is in the outlining method. This is an example here of somebody that just wrote, this is all they reviewed before their midterm. I asked if I could borrow this from a student taking econ several years ago. Um, all they did is they wrote down the lecture and very key points. So there were seven lectures that they had, seven discussions they had to review and they just wrote key points down here. So this is another example of um, using summary notes. And this is basically what they reviewed. Now they had their main notes in their textbook next to them, but this is kind of what she reviewed the day before she took her midterm. So that's an example of summary notes in an outline format. She just put down the key points and some formulas that she had to remember. So that was another example right there. So that's um, pretty much um, for self-quizzing, good. Pretty much um, all I have there. Um, one of the things I'll do right now to close, because I'm coming up to the end of the time, is I'll go ahead and send you um, a copy of a uh, survey that you're welcome to clean. And I'll leave this up after 2.30 if you need to pull it up. You don't, you know, if you, you, you can pull it up and save it um, and um, uh, write it out separately. I don't know um, if either, I think I asked one of you if you were getting additional credit. So that's the link to the survey. Basically all it is, it just asks you if there's any suggestions or ways to um, improve um, or things that you can recommend. This is what the survey looks like. It just has some questions. If you do say you're receiving additional credit, it will open up an additional question on who you, specifically your name, and then um, what courses, uh, what, what instructors are giving you additional credit. There is also a link on question five. If you open this link, it's a little critique about the workshop. This is anonymous. If you open up this link, it will open up a separate page. So you do need to go back to this first page and, and send in for the um, workshop attendance. Um, and again, if you don't fill out, if you don't fill out uh, the information for getting additional credit, and when you fill out this initial survey part, it will leave it anonymous. But the actual survey for writing additional comments on the workshop itself will open up on a second page right there. So you can feel free to have that. And again, yes, if you miss any uh, questions or want some additional material on the workshop, And that's on the PowerPoint presentation that I downloaded. It's tutoring at cwi.edu. Um, and you can send that in and just say you attended the listening and note-taking workshop and like some additional information or follow-up questions on, on the, the um, what we talked about today. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight into note-taking. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do sometimes, like you said, depending on the classes, but um, it does provide you um, a real wealth of, of information. And it's in your own words too, basically. Yeah, well, thank you. And I'll just leave uh, the links open if you need them for a few minutes. But if you're all done, you can go ahead and log off. And I really appreciate your participation. Hopefully, it would have been nice if we had a few more students, but I really appreciate the interaction that the two of you did today. So thank you. And um, I hope to see you at some of our future workshops. So have a good uh, day and a nice upcoming weekend.